an unseasonably strong cold front moves south through the Great Plains, a tropical disturbance moves up from the Gulf of Mexico, and Hurricane K weakens into a tropical storm as it grazes the southern California coast. There it is on the visible satellite imagery off the coast of San Diego, and switching over to the infrared imagery, that gives you a more classic look at the circulation. And there's the surface map for this afternoon. It is starting to look like October. Check out the northern plains, temperatures in the 50s and 60s, and Cheyenne down to 48 at the Sour, 42 up at Casper. That's some very cool air. You can see the cold advection showers developing there. Combination of upslope flow and orographic lift with those easterlies affecting the northern Rockies. Off the California coast, yeah, there it is, K. That's going to be maybe about 100 miles off the coast of San Diego, somewhere in there. And up to the north, extensive wildfire smoke. It's certainly worth taking a look at the satellite imagery in that region. Some extensive smoke out there southeast of Salem. And also some more smoke around Lake Tahoe into Sacramento and other smoke layers all the way into Idaho and Montana. And as we get to the Continental Divide, we pick up that other polar system with the easterly flow. You can see the cold advection cumulus developing some showers and maybe a few thunderstorms across Montana. And then we get into the more stratiform precip out there in Wyoming and Nebraska. The eastern U.S. under the influence of this decaying polar high, temperatures in the upper 70s and lower 80s, contrasting with the near 60 readings along this front. Out to the east, we also see a little bit of Hurricane Earl. And there it is, northeast of Bermuda, 100 mile an hour winds, putting it in the lower category 2 end of the Saffir Simpson scale. That is heading off well out to sea and staying off the coast of Newfoundland. So no impacts there for the east U.S. However, there are extensive swells and riptides affecting much of the east coast all the way down towards the Caribbean. And that will continue to be a problem for at least a few days. The Bermuda High will be building back in gradually. There's not much trace of that. You can see a little bit of it right there. And as that begins building back in, the gradient between that Bermuda High and this tropical disturbance will increase the southerly flow and start advecting a lot of moisture into the Carolinas and Georgia. Precipitable waters will be coming up to about two inches in that area, and flash flooding could be a problem going into the weekend, although the low soil moisture will alleviate that a little bit. So heading up into Canada, there's that polar high, 1022 millibars, driving cool air into the northern plains. You can see that as we get into the prairies, temperatures fall off to the 40s. Looks like about 50 around Saskatoon, dropping into the 40s out around Churchill. So the temperatures come down quite a bit. We saw 80s in this area last week. Alaska looking rainy. Not much surprise there, but the increased moisture coming up from the lower latitudes, bringing in significant moisture, precipitable water up to about one and a half inches around Valdez. Cordova reported six and a half inches over the past 24 to 36 hours. Power Creek, 10.3 inches in 30 hours. That's significant moisture for Alaska and they've had rapid rises of rivers and streams through that area yesterday and today. Some of the warmer air flowing up into southern Yukon, and as we go further to the northeast, we get back into that polar air, and this is kind of all part of that polar ridge extending into the prairies. And then going into the eastern Arctic, eastern Canadian Arctic, we get back into that occlusion that we talked about Wednesday, Gradually merging with the old frontal low and starting to die off. Central pressure 984, and we should see less and less of that over the next few days. 
then going down into Canada, another warm sector across Quebec, temperatures up to about 76 to 80 around Montreal. And that brings us back to the eastern U.S. And I should mention Texas, although they are in a transitional air mass zone, the more tropical air located down in the south, we do have a dry line, very weak dry line starting to form. And that defines a boundary between dry air in the Texas panhandles and slightly more moist air through the Interstate 35 corridor. Let's check in on that heat wave. These are the observed high temperatures yesterday. 113 at Sacramento, and I think that's the highest that I'm seeing on that map. Death Valley, of course, is going to be a lot higher, but they're not part of the federal network. Yesterday, there were also records in terms of the overnight low. Yesterday morning, it was 78 at Fresno, 82 at Bakersfield. That's the minimum temperature, and that broke a record for the overnight minimum, the warmest overnight minimum. But today is going to be the last day of any record-breaking heat. Let's take a look at the forecast for today. And you can see that we're really taking the edge off the heat. Earlier this week, it was 116 at Sacramento. But for today, just a few records being broken. 106 at Merced, 97 at Camarillo, and 96 up there near Mount Shasta. For tomorrow, on Saturday, some heat migrates up north. 105 at Medford, that will break the record set in 1923. I think that's 20, 22 or 23. And 99 at Eugene. And for Sunday, we are looking at really no records, except Miami tying the record set in 1993. Hurricane K, or the remains of Hurricane K, really biting into that pattern, destroying the ridge, and bring in a lot of moisture northward. The clouds associated with all that also helping to reduce the solar heat. No records on Monday. Looking pretty good. Same story for Tuesday. And on Wednesday as well. And for Thursday. So we're finally done with that record-breaking heat wave. Heading into San Diego and Los Angeles, there's the bands associated with K spreading northward. And you can see that these are distinctly convective. Moving into Orange County and Riverside. And the radar imagery from San Diego. Well, there is going to be a little bit of beam blockage. We'll have to look at other radars to look at the deserts. But the coastal regions showing low instability convection. Just a lot of showers, and they do look a little bit stratified, and some indication of the circulation offshore where we have that curvature coming together. Now, these bands moving north into San Diego, these could have a few lightning strikes within them, maybe a little bit of thunder, but overall, we're not really looking at a whole lot of convective activity. In the deserts where we have a little bit more moisture and heating, we do have more extensive showers and storms. There's the more active ones. You can see on the echo tops, those are up to about uh, maybe about 25 or 30,000 and quite a line from about El Centro through Yuma and down into the northwest part of Mexico. And there's the Los Angeles radar. Yeah, you can definitely see that beam blockage right through here the line of showers and storms located right there and just not getting a good view of that but this is good for the coastal areas that rain and shower activity is moving into the LA area and the surface plots at this hour does show the easterly flow taking over there is going to be a little bit of lee side effect on the west side of these mountain ranges so you can see that the temperatures out there in the Los Angeles area close to 100 at this hour 101 at LAX, and 99 at Long Beach. November 4, Gulf Echo. The um, LAL Timbers 29053, squawk 0267. The Los Angeles area under easterly flow, LAX located right here. East flow is pretty rare for the summertime, but due to the influence of Tropical Storm K, 
we do have that in effect. And you probably heard the altimeter setting, 29.53 inches. That is pretty low. There's a nice graphic of the flooding potential in the deserts, especially the western Mojave Desert out around the Salton Sea to the coastal range. Moderate potential for flash flood. There's what the precip looks like for the next 24 hours, looking at about an inch, maybe some isolated inch and a half out in that same area, and the precipitation extending all the way to the Grand Canyon, Flagstaff, Winslow, and up towards St. George. Over the next three days, let's check out that graphic. You can see those rains moving up into the Carolinas and into Virginia, where we're expecting two to three inches. Also, a new frontal system coming together in the Midwest. That's going to bring some potential for three to four inch rains, especially around Milwaukee and Madison. And going into the five day range, you can see that this plume spreads up into the central and northern Rockies. That's the remnants of K, the high precipitable water, continuing to drift northward from day to day. There's some interaction each day with the solar heating, so we get a new round day after day of storms and showers, and that's what we'll probably see until about midweek, and gradually that moisture will disperse and move up into the Yellowstone, Idaho, Montana area, and we'll see that precip shutting down in Arizona and Nevada. Most of these totals that you see here, those are for this weekend, but it's going to be drying as we go into next week. So the precipitable water is the best way to see this happening. There's those two-inch amounts spreading northward. This is going to be this morning. But as we go through the evening hours, there you go. It moves up into the deserts, into Las Vegas, and even into the San Joaquin area. Precipitable water amounts, Bakersfield, Fresno, an inch and a half. So a lot of California getting some potential for precip. But as we go into Monday and Tuesday, you can see some dry air spreading into the central U.S., there is going to be a frontal system coming together in Illinois and Indiana. Warm front like that, an occluded front back into around La Crosse and Madison. And there is going to be some rain associated with that and a bit of cold core activity on the backside as possible. Then as we go forward through the rest of the week, Tuesday and Wednesday, you can see the moisture dispersing up into the Great Basin area, especially around Salt Lake City. Looks like three quarters of an inch. And some drying sets in. So looking much drier by Friday in the western U.S. And let's bring that back and look at the eastern U.S. We see that plume of moisture spreading into the Carolinas, heading right up into Pennsylvania New Jersey by Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Then we get the cold air advection coming in from the west. And more moisture spreading northward along the Texas Gulf Coast around midweek. There's that new plume, and that'll surge northward towards next weekend. And very likely by next weekend, around the 17th and 18th, we're going to see potential for rains in the Midwest region. And some of those could be heavy. And that concludes our Friday edition of Forecast Lab. I want to thank our newest supporter, Michael Rose. Welcome back to the program. I do remember you from a couple years ago, and I appreciate your support. And also thanks to our many supporters and Patreon contributors that helped keep this program going. And I'll leave you with some footage around the San Antonio area. Thanks to Greg once again for this great footage. We'll see everybody back here on Monday for the supporters and Wednesday for everybody else. Take care. Bye-bye.